Well, good morning. You can turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. We'll be in verses 23 to 30 together this morning. Before I read this text, I'll remind you that in the paragraph prior, the rich young ruler has just come to Jesus, a young man that seemed to have life all together uh, morally on the outside and was very wealthy on top of this. The kind of man that in Jewish society in the first century was seen as a leader among the people, perhaps first in line to be one of Jesus' followers, and yet Jesus laid his finger on the pulse of this young man's problem, suggesting, what if you had to give up your wealth to follow me? That young man walked away sad because he was not willing to do that. And so verses 23 to 30 transpire, perhaps, as they are watching this rich young ruler walk away sorrowful, having rejected Jesus at that time, and Jesus turns and teaches his disciples a lesson based on this. We're going to see Jesus together this morning teach on the risk of wealth and the reward for sacrifice. The risk of wealth and the reward for for sacrifice. Let me read these verses to you. Matthew 19, 23, Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, well, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Well, then Peter said in reply, see, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Let's pray. Father, as always, we need your help. We need the work of your Spirit in us. Teach us, Lord, what your Word means. Reveal to us the meaning of your Word and how it points us to you and applies to our lives. And Father, we will not interpret your Word rightly without the illuminating help of your Spirit at work within us. And moreover, Father, we will not desire to change. We won't want to be more like Christ without the gracious work of your Holy Spirit in us, sanctifying us, convicting us of sin, drawing us ever closer. And so, Father, we ask for your work in us through your word, by your spirit, to make us more like Christ this morning. Father, we pray all of this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. As we come to Matthew 19... Jesus begins to speak to them a little more directly about wealth, about the risk of wealth and the reward of sacrifice. Uh, He's not speaking into a vacuum. He has spent time with the disciples now um, about three years. They've heard Jesus teach about wealth already. Matthew 6.24, Jesus had said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Or in Matthew 8, 19 and 20, a scribe came up to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Saying, in essence, I see you seeing me teaching in public. Maybe you think I have an elevated position in society now, or maybe by following me, you'll become successful, but he's saying, "Um, do you realize that I have less position and possessions in current society than a fox or a bird? (laughs) 
Mine is an itinerant ministry. We travel. We have only enough for daily provisions. Are you really willing to come and take on that lifestyle? So the disciples who have been with Jesus for three years are living this lifestyle, and yet they also know the history of their nation. They know that the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were all very wealthy. Uh, They know that David, a man after God's own heart, was by God's design wealthy. They know that Solomon himself had so much wealth that people came from around the world to see his incredible wealth and to hear his wisdom. In fact, those realities were so common in Israel that the average Israelite assumed that wealth was always a sign of God's blessing upon a person. If a person comes and they're well put together and they have a a nice house and barns full of grain and savings for the future, well, clearly they are one on whom the favor of the Lord is shining most brightly. Now, in the mind of a first century Jew, they were not wrong to think this. Turn with me back to Deuteronomy. Go to Deuteronomy um, 28 with me. I'll show you why the Jews may have um, felt this way. When Jesus created the nation of Israel through Abraham in order to bring the Messiah into the world through them and bless the whole world, he explained his terms of the Old Covenant. And he told them, I'm going to put you in a special land flowing with milk and honey. And if you're obedient to me, I'm going to bless you in every way. If you're disobedient to me, I'm going to discipline you in many ways so that a watching world will know that I am real and that you are my people. But listen to the language here in Deuteronomy 28. Verse 1, if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Jump down to verse 8. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Jump down to verse 11. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity, in the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your livestock and in the fruit of your ground within the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasury the heavens to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall only go up, not down, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, being careful to do them. Well, these were some of the covenant blessings to Israel in the Old Covenant in the land of Israel. In fact, perhaps you've heard modern prosperity preachers who take these texts out of context and apply them directly to Christians today and say, well, here it is. If we are obedient to God, then he will bless us financially. Our barns will be full. Our bank accounts will be overrunning. This is flatly wrong. It absolutely violates God's word. These promises of material blessing were real from God to the nation state of Israel under the old covenant before Christ came when God was using them as an example of his blessing and cursing to the broader world. This is not the case today in the new covenant for us as the body of Christ, as Christians in the church era. But you can see where Jews in the first century might have to wrestle with this. Well, wait a minute. But we know what God said in Deuteronomy and how he would work among the Jewish people. But here comes Jesus teaching that um, foxes have holes and birds have nests, and he's got neither. He didn't have a pillow. He says we can't serve God and money. And so this creates an interesting tension in the mind of a first century Jew. And so is the rich young ruler again walks away from Jesus sorrowful because he was unwilling to give up his wealth, even hypothetically, to come and follow Jesus, and he was honest enough to admit it. Then Jesus' own disciples turned to Jesus with wide eyes 
expecting to be instructed on the nature of wealth. And so Jesus begins by explaining to them the risk of wealth. Look at chapter 19, starting in verse 23 with me. We get this statement of principle. Truly I say to you, this is a a statement that marks off, listen carefully, here's the key. This is a common phrase in Israel. Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. What an interesting statement. Those listening to Jesus in the first century are going to have to adjust their expectation of what riches mean because clearly they have no advantage before the Lord. So Jesus is teaching his disciples, get that one-to-one connection between wealth and holiness out of your mind. It does not exist. In fact, Jesus tells them, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Not only is that wealth not automatically a sign of God's blessing, it is, in fact, a potential stumbling block for most people. As in Jesus' day, so in ours. You know, Matthew 10, 37 to 39, Jesus had already said, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus says that true followers of his come to him willing to lay down whatever is necessary to follow him. Those seeking to find their life now, meaning I will do all that I can to pad my life now, to support my own comfort and prosperity now. The one who lives in that way has misordered priorities and may not know the Lord at all. But the one who is willing to lay down those earthly comforts and pursuits now in order to follow Jesus may well be evidencing a new heart that God has brought about and the reordered priorities that come with it. Jesus goes on. He gives this direct statement, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom. And then he gives an illustration and he does so in a hilarious way. He says, you know, Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. He uses this extreme hyperbole. A camel is the largest animal in that part of the Middle East, and a needle is the smallest opening that normal people in a pre-microscopic world ever had to deal with. Um, I can barely get a thread through a needle now, and it's a thread. It's small enough to fit through, right? It's still maddening. I try an occasion when I have to fix something. Jesus points to a camel likely standing near them, which was common in that part of the world, and says, you know, the day you can fit him with all of his gear through the eye of a needle, that will be the day that it will be easy for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, that was a shocking statement. It upended their understanding of wealth and the blessing of God and and fitness for the kingdom. It was also hilarious and memorable. There was a similar statement in Persia about an elephant in the eye of a needle. And Jesus apparently co-opts that for his setting. The eye of the needle may also be an apt metaphor because Jesus had already talked about the narrowness of the way that leads to life. Do you remember this? Jesus often speaks of this narrow path that is difficult to traverse. And he says to be on that narrow way is very difficult when you are so encumbered by worldly desires. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, he said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. We can add another illustration that Jesus gave of the dangers of riches back in Matthew 13, 22. When he said, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. In the parable of the four soils, Um, The word goes out like seed and is received by various hearts, right? 
That's the soil. And one of these individuals or categories of people hears the word, something of a faith springs up, and yet it's choked out by the thorns of riches. And Jesus uses worldly riches to picture thorns that grab onto a small tender plant and choke it out, refusing to let it grow up as big and strong as it needs to, sucking all the nutrients out of the soil. I think that is an apt metaphor. Jesus, we'll see as we go, is not saying that there is anything inherently wrong or sinful about riches themselves. If that were true, then God wouldn't have made the patriarchs and David and Solomon wealthy. What Jesus is saying in the rest of the scriptures is that those riches are dangerous because of their potential to become snares to us. Most people cannot grow up among great wealth without that wealth getting its thorns into them and hampering their growth in the Lord. That wealth often becomes a distraction as individuals have to be constantly checking various properties and stock portfolios and business opportunities to the degree that they begin to serve that wealth rather than serving the Lord Jesus and others with a sense of freedom. Well, this happened to Demas in 2 Timothy 4.10. Paul says, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. There were certain pleasures of the world that Demas just couldn't go without anymore. This whole thing of following Jesus and not having so much as a foxhole or a bird's nest, Paul lived very similarly, you know, thrown in jail quite often, shipwrecked from time to time, as people are. His was truly taking up a cross to follow Jesus. Demas could hang for a while, And then he decided that he needed some of the comforts of the world. So Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. What does that mean? It means that the draw of worldly riches finally got their thorns back in Demas, and he just couldn't keep going. So he gave in to the briar patch and let it consume him. Paul told Timothy to warn his congregation about the dangers of wealth in 1 Timothy um, 6, 6 through 10. This is a pastoral reality. Paul telling young Timothy that you need to warn those in your congregation who are wealthy to live carefully with that wealth. He says, 1 Timothy 6, 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Notice that so far there's no mention of wealth. You can be godly and have great contentment in abject poverty and extreme wealth. The second is harder, Scripture is clear, because there are so many more temptations and distractions. But you can find godliness with contentment in either state. It's just difficult. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. There it is again. Now, has he said in this verse that the riches themselves are evil? No. He says those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and into a snare, into many, notice that language of the thorns again, (laughs) a trap, and into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Now, if you get your theology from Facebook, which I strongly suggest you not do, you will see memes that float around, and often they'll misquote this verse and say that money is the root of all evil. That's wrong on two counts. It does not say that. It says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's not the money itself that is evil, although Jesus is warning us that it is a temptation that few can withstand. If it is there to be had, so many will have it. And if they can have more, they will. And if they can have more, they will. And it becomes an insurmountable temptation to some. But it's not the money that's the problem. It's the love of money that is the root of all different sorts of evil. 
I have seen people with a lot of money fall into various types of sin on many occasions because money may not buy happiness, but it can buy anything else. And so when the heart desires something and has the money to get it, then one finds that the love of money can lead to all sorts of evils. And Paul continues, it's through this craving, this craving for more and more wealth, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Notice again, it is through this craving It's the desire to be rich. It's the love of money. It's the craving to have more that ends up choking out someone's soul. Not the amount of poverty or riches that one has in the first place. Verse 25 continues, When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished. They were not used to someone speaking in this way and talking about wealth being a barrier to entry to the kingdom for many. Not only a barrier, but Jesus goes out of his way to say an abject impossibility. Wait a minute. So they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? If this is the case... Jesus, if the rich young ruler who was manifestly obedient to the law, and I believe he was, I don't think he was lying or exaggerating, when he said, what must I do? And Jesus plays with him a little and says, "Mm, keep the law. He says, I have kept the law. I think he had, meaning he was obedient. And when he sinned, he took the allotted sacrifices to the temple to atone for his sins, was waiting for the Messiah to come, meaning I am living faithfully under the terms of the old covenant. He is obedient on the one hand, and he appears to be blessed by God with riches on the other hand, and yet he walked away sorrowful. And so the disciples ask, well, then who can be saved, if not this guy with every advantage we know about? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The question now shifts away from wealth and to the, uh, the idea of salvation in general. If this guy that seems to be at the forefront of Israel's hopes is far from the kingdom, then who can be saved? Can anyone be saved is in essence what they're asking. Jesus looks at them and says, now you're asking the right question. And he says, I want you to know the answer is no. No. Left to themselves left to what's possible among humans in their own power, no salvation is possible. Not a single human will be saved. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Salvation, we know, cannot be earned. This young fellow may have been quite manifestly obedient, but he certainly could not earn his salvation. Romans 3.19 says, We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, Why? So that every mouth may be stopped and that the whole world may be held accountable to God because by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. You cannot earn your salvation, neither can you purchase salvation. There's no amount of wealth that automatically puts someone in a position of good standing with God. In fact, to try to rely on your wealth before God is only offensive. Acts chapter 8, there was a magician there named Simon who heard the apostles preaching and had some sort of an initial reaction of excitement at the message that they preached, although I think that he was like the other soils that sprang up briefly and proved to be not genuine. What happens in Acts 8.18, now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Hey guys, how much do I have to pay to get into the inner circle so I can do the Holy Spirit thing? Because I've got some silver. How dishonoring that was, Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Excuse me. 
You cannot earn your salvation. You certainly cannot purchase God's acceptance. Turn to John chapter 6 in your Bible. Left to ourselves, it will be just as impossible for a poor person, a middle-class person, or an extravagantly wealthy person to be saved. It is not difficult, it is impossible. But Jesus went on to say that with God, all things are possible. We can praise God together this morning that no single salvation that has ever occurred in the history of humanity has taken place because of the power of the one who was saved. We can praise God together that it is our sovereign God who graciously saves sinners out of death and brings them to new life. In John chapter 6, jump down to verse 29 with me. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. He is working among them in order that they may believe. Jump over to verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Are there some who come to Christ? Yes and amen. Why? Because our loving Father is drawing sinners out of death and unto life. Jump down to verse 44 where Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Praise be to God that he has been drawing sinners to himself from the beginning. Jump finally over to verse 65. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. We see that salvation has always been impossible in human strength, but it has always been possible whenever and wherever God is saving sinners from death. I love the book of John, John chapter 6, especially because the heart of Jesus, our shepherd, is on full display along with our hope of salvation, which is the power of our sovereign God. And so Jesus reminds them, he answers the question about who can be saved and says, now you're getting somewhere. Now you're asking the right question. Now you're understanding that because of God's holiness and your sinfulness, every salvation is an impossibility until God opens the eyes of the one who is still blind, until God breathes new life into a walking corpse. Until God draws someone who is still at odds with him into a loving relationship with him. And when that happens, then salvation is not only possible, it is unstoppable. All of us sitting here today are the evidence of that if you have repented and believed in the Lord Jesus alone unto salvation. Now we'll answer the question a little more specifically. Is it possible for one who is very rich to be saved? Well, the answer, fortunately, is of course. Uh, 1 Corinthians one twenty six is a wonderful, curious little verse. It says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. In the 1700s, a woman of the aristocracy named Lady Huntingdon later said that she was saved by a letter. She was born in a 40-room mansion in a beautiful part of England. She was spared no luxury that one could enjoy. She was in the inner circles of the uppermost crust of England alongside of kings and queens and other um, royals and old money families. It was around this time that a famous quote exists from, I think it may have been the queen at the time, who wrote in a letter how much she despised it when preachers would say that there was no difference between her heart and the heart of those wretches that live out on the streets. You see, many who were born in that fancy white glove sort of environment could not possibly imagine, they couldn't believe that they were no closer to God with all of their wealth and gentility. 
Well, in that same environment, a woman just as rich, Lady Huntingdon, heard the gospel, was cut to the heart, knew at once that she was a wretched sinner and deserved hell along with everyone out on the streets and had no more claim uh, to the throne room of God because of her wealth. And she repented and believed and became an active and on fire growing Christian. She began to use her wealth to build churches and support ministry all around England and, in fact, in the colonies in America. And while most of you haven't heard her name, you likely have heard the name of George Whitfield, arguably the greatest preacher and evangelist of the English language, almost certainly bar none. George Whitfield's ministry was financially underwritten in large part by Lady Huntington. Had the Lord not saved her and put it on her humble and and gentle and turnable heart to support gospel ministry around England and the rest of the world, then George Whitfield would not have preached and had the impact that he did. And she later remarked, oh, thank God I was saved by a letter. She said, because this verse doesn't say, not any of you were powerful, not any of you were of noble birth, but not many of you were powerful and of noble birth, so she was saved by an M. (laughs) So, are we saying that it's impossible for a very wealthy person to follow the Lord Jesus, to be saved? Of course not. It is just as possible as God saving someone who is in poverty or the middle classes. That wealth will present a unique challenge to that individual. They will need to cling to God's Word. They'll need to cling to passages like 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. Well, this was part of of Timothy's pastoral ministry to his church was to teach the wealthy. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future." so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Notice the difference. You'll hear the phrase, it's part of the vernacular, if someone is enjoying a day of particular ease and comfort, uh, perhaps they're on a new boat and they are uh, at the lake and it is beautiful and uh, maybe they have a nice new lake house and they can just put their feet up and relax. What do they say? They say, man, now we're really living. Right? Have you heard that phrase? Have you used that? Now, or, now this is the life. Right? We say that when we're enjoying some particular pleasure, maybe that we don't normally get to enjoy. We say, now this, this is the life. Why? Because it's so deeply embedded in us to think that ease and comfort and lack of suffering and sacrificial service is a better state. And yet that assumption was never in the mind of Jesus, who willingly sacrificed and suffered so that we could be saved. So Paul tells Timothy to um, encourage the wealthy to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, spiritual treasures, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. You know, it's when we're able, by God's grace, to have enough left over after buying what we need to help someone else, to meet someone else's need, maybe even in a way that's sacrificial for us, and we see God use that and we see the joy in their face, that's when we should be saying, now this is living. This is the life. When we have enough left over that we can bless someone else, we should say, now We're really living. Lord, thank you. Thank you. This is the risk of wealth. The more we have, the more it can get its hooks into us until we begin serving it instead of using it to serve God by serving others. But the second half of this passage, Jesus talks about the reward for sacrifice. Look at verse 27 with me. Peter said in reply, see, we left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Well, when Jesus called um, his disciples, he said to them, follow me, I will make you fishers of men in Matthew 4. 
Matthew 4.20, immediately they left their nets and followed him. When he then called James and John, we read, immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. They left possessions, costly nets and boats. They left family relationships. They lived there in their hometown, hometown, which was familiar to them. They left the family business, close ties with father and siblings. They left all of this. They left a profession. They had spent time honing their craft and felt good when they did it. They truly had left all of this to come and follow Jesus. And Jesus had told them in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 20 and 21, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He also had told them in Matthew 6, verses 4, 6 and 18, your father who sees in secret will reward you. And in 6.33, after telling the crowd not to worry about daily needs, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. How interesting. Peter is picking up on the fact that monetary wealth isn't it. But he's going, Jesus, you have talked a lot about reward for following you. Now, at this point, a lot of commentators take a shot at Peter. Oh, look at Peter. He's thinking like the worldly people again. I don't find that at all in the text. I see Peter seeing the rich young man going away sad in the distance, hearing Jesus saying, wealth ain't it, doesn't get you any closer to God. In fact, it can be a hindrance, it can distract you. Um, And they say, well, who can be saved? Jesus says, well, with God, anyone whom God saves, that's who. But it is impossible by human standards. But Peter is going, okay, but you also have talked a lot about reward for those who sacrifice to follow you. So What is that reward? How will you reward us? What is in store for us then, Jesus? Because I'm going to take you at your word. I think that's all Peter is doing, is bringing together these different threads of teaching that Jesus has given in a way that no rabbi at the time uh, could have answered. This is new category. This is new territory, new categories. It's the new covenant. So they're just saying, Jesus, please hold this together for us. What is the reward for sacrificing for you? And so Jesus answers. Look at verse 28. Uh, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, so Jesus now is talking about position, about a position of authority. His, of course, will be ultimate. You who have followed me, notice they gave up their positions in their communities to come and follow him like a fox with no hole or a bird with no nest. That come and follow me as an itinerant minister and sleep out under the stars or on people's floors or borrowed upper rooms. I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel." This is beautiful. I I take this quite literally. I think that when Jesus establishes his kingdom on this earth, that these 12 will have positions of authority in some way. I think that they will be rewarded with some sort of reign in a quite literal sense. But I think this points forward also uh, in another sense to the reign that all of us will share in as we are united to Christ in the new world. It will reign even over angels, we're told. Jesus told the disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Peter and the others had done this. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And Peter, I'm well aware of what you have given up to come and follow me, as he is saying. And I want you to know that any positions you have sacrificed to be faithful in following me will be rewarded far greater than what you've given up here and now. But the reward comes later. He talks about the reward for sacrificed possessions as well. Look at verse 29. Anyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. 
but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Matthew 16, 27. Uh, For the Son of Man is going to come with His angels in the glory of His Father, and then He will repay each person according to what He has done. This is true in judgment of the wicked, but it's also true when God in Christ rewards believers who have followed Him in the eternal state. In fact, in Mark 10, Mark's version elevates this. Jesus said, those who give up these things for me, verse 30, um, will receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. Now, what is this? Is this this again some prosperity message? No. What does he mean? Obviously, it's not literal because he says if you give up a house, you'll have 100 houses. What does he mean? He means that if you're willing to sacrifice opportunities to come and follow Jesus, maybe when you trust in Christ and make that public, family members cut you off. Some have been disinherited because of this. Some have been pushed out of their homes and quite literally lost a house or a family. Jesus is saying, if you lose a house for my name's sake, you come and join yourself to the body of Christ And you will find a hundred houses open to you today. That's what he's saying. You sacrifice family who write you off as dead because of your commitment to Christ, you'll find a hundred, two hundred, three hundred brothers and sisters willing to stand in the gap and love you and pray for you and encourage you. He's talking about the blessings of being part of a local church family, of the body of Christ in this new covenant era. That's what he's talking about. And he said, yes, it does come with persecutions. Sorry, those who would preach a health and wealth gospel. No, we know that it comes with the same kind of persecutions that Jesus had. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, 2 Timothy 3.12. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God, Acts 14.22. In this world, you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, John 16, 33. But make no mistake, what Jesus said to the disciples then is true for Christians now. Those who are willing to sacrifice positions and possessions for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and following him and serving him will be rewarded in the eternal state, in the kingdom and beyond on a new earth in a way that far surpasses anything that was given up for him because our God is good and generous. I want to end with a corporate application. As a church, the Laodiceans trusted in their wealth in Revelation 3. Now, you likely remember that the Lord Jesus told them that they were lukewarm neither hot nor cold, and that he would spit them out of his mouth. Now that verse, again, if you're going to get your theology from Facebook, that verse is often the subject of memes and applied to individual Christians. Um, That's just not the application. Jesus is speaking here to a church family, the church in Laodicea. It's about the spiritual temperature of a church together. Whether or not that church is, is hot after God, are they, are they healing and refreshing, hot and cold, or are they just sort of moving along in the middle? That's what's happening in Laodicea in Revelation 3.16. By the way, what does uh, I will spit you out of my mouth mean? It's the Lord Jesus saying to the church in Laodicea, um, I will quench the candle of your church. I will providentially shut down your church is what he's saying. So you're aware of that image of hot and cold and lukewarm, but do you know why? Why the Laodiceans had become so lukewarm that Jesus was saying, I might have to shut your church down? Well, Revelation 3.17 says, because you say, I am rich, I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. You see, the Laodiceans were in a good place financially. Um, They were paying all their bills. Uh, They were probably able to set aside some elders vocationally, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. They were able to meet all their obligations. They were able to probably help the poor in their community. Maybe God had been so good to them 
that for four years in a row they were meeting all of their monthly obligations and saving extra money and saving in a building fund so that they could have a bigger, nicer building so they could all meet together in one service instead of in two. (laughs) I made up that last one because that's us. Isn't that interesting, though? And it was not lost on me as I studied this text this week. God has been so kind to us in these last four years. So we came together as a church merger some four years ago. Um, That was not an easy time prior to that for either congregation. We came together in a little building that doesn't quite fit us, so we have to do two services. We couldn't do Sunday school for any age for a long time. We just didn't have the space. The youth group met off-site. I could go on, but you get the point. And yet all through COVID and the aftermath of that, the Lord simply poured out his kindness. And we have seen so many folks baptized and joined to this local church. We rejoice in that. And God has been so generous through the members of this local church that we're above budget every uh, year for four years. Such that we're able to pray cautiously and excitedly about the possibility of a new building here so that we could all meet together in one service again instead of multiple services. And as I thought through all that this week, studying this text, I thought, wait a minute, Lord. This means that we might now be susceptible to the danger that the Laodiceans were falling victim to. How quickly our hearts attach themselves to gifts instead of the giver. How easy it would be for us to sit back on our haunches spiritually And stop crying out to God in utter desperation, God, we need you. Without you, Father, we will fall into sin. We will reject you. We will blow it in every conceivable way. If you don't pray like that in desperation, you haven't yet learned to pray. And if we as a church family don't continue to pray together, Lord, you've been so kind for so long, it seems so clear that you're doing something unique and special in our midst. Father, help us to see what that is and to follow you carefully and humbly and and in a dependent way. If we're not praying that way, then we will be in danger of the Laodicean problem, of trusting in our wealth instead of in the one who has given every single penny of it. So I would encourage you this week as you move into the week, think about your own personal wealth. Is it a hindrance to you and a constant distraction? Or is it something that you see yourself as a steward of to serve God by serving others? And let's think about ourselves together as a church. Are we using this time in which God has been gracious to us to do more ministry, to love God well and be dependent upon Him and to cry out to Him for help and guidance? Or will we be tempted to sit back and say, oh man, we're doing great, we can skate for a while. I would call you to be in prayer on both sides. Let's pray that God would use us as good stewards of His good gifts. In whatever way that he determines is his will for us in this church family at this time. That must be our prayer together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, for your goodness, for your gifts. Lord, we pause and we thank you again that you have been kind to us so that we can meet our obligations and serve you and serve others and support missions and help those in financial need. What a joy it's been to do so much of that, Father, over these years. And we pray that you would use us to do that more in the future. Father, help us to be good stewards. (laughs) Remind us, Father, that we are dependent upon you every moment of every day, every month, every year. Father, unite our hearts to fear your name and to cry out with one voice for you to guide us and give us wisdom in our stewardship. We want to walk before you as individuals and as a church family in humble faithfulness, Lord. We thank you for your love unto us in Christ, and we pray all of this in his name. Amen. Amen.